And as they go back to their seats, I have an assignment for everyone in the congregation, young and old alike. There are probably pads of paper in your pews or something to write on. They're definitely writing utensils. Um, so grab something to write on. And I want you to take a moment and make a list of the top five, ten if you like, if you've got the time, but top five things you love in order of which you love the most. The top five things you love the most. Number one, two, three, four, and five. If you go to ten, it doesn't matter. If you only get three, it's okay as well. But the top things you love the most in the order in which you love them. You might include family on that list, parents, spouse, children. You might include your friends. You might include food. I was texting Pastor R yesterday, and he said his number one love is ice cream. You might include money, possessions like this left-handed picture from my great-grandma, other keepsakes, the photos you have on your wall, that little piece of jewelry, memories. You might just put yourself, be honest there, you know, your body, your abilities, your intelligence, your health, your looks. What are the top five things you love the most? All right. Hopefully you have three or four now. Again, it doesn't have to be a complete list. Maybe you have 10 already. That's okay too. There's this part of Jesus' sermon to his disciples today that always leaves me a little unsettled. Whoever loves their parents more than me isn't worthy of me. And whoever loves their children more than me isn't worthy of me, Jesus says. And whoever doesn't take up the cross and follow me isn't worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. And let me tell you, Matthew lets us off easy. If you read this same sermon in Luke's gospel, remember each of the gospels are slightly different in their wording. In Luke's gospel, Jesus reports, Luke reports Jesus saying, whoever doesn't hate their parents cannot be my disciples. I mean, Matthew lets us off easy. When I first began my ministry, a parent came up to me and challenged me on these verses. She begged, do you mean I have to choose between God and my family? I thought part of God's calling was to love and care for family. In Luther's day, people begged another question based on this text. Does this mean I should kill myself so that Jesus can save me? You know, whoever loves their life more than me. People begged a lot on these questions, and these are tough questions on a tough passage. And to answer them, I think we need to consider the first commandment. Does anyone know what the first commandment is? Okay, you all talked at once, and none of you very loudly, so give me one. Carol, nice and loud. Yes. You shall have no other gods. Yep, before me. And does anyone know what Martin Luther says this commandment means? Who's got their small catechism memorized still? Okay, open your hymnals. There's hymnals in the pews. You can find hymnals in the pews. Open your hymnals to page 1160. It's in the very back of the hymnal. Page numbers at the bottom. Page 1160. Not the Bibles. I know. They're similar looking. Open your hymnals. 
very bottom, at the very back of the hymnal, page 1160. And if you get to 1160, it should say the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Then it should say, what does this mean? And Martin Luther writes, we are to fear, love, and trust God above all things. Above all things. And if you continue reading, when Luther interprets the other nine commandments and says, what does this mean? All nine of them, he starts by saying the words, we are to fear and love God. In each of his explanations, he begins by placing the other nine commandments in the context of and under that first commandment. We are to fear, love, and trust God above all things. One time in confirmation, after reading the third commandment, remember the Sabbath, a youth asked, so does this mean if my chore is laundry and Sunday's my only day to do laundry, that I'm sinning by, that my parents are making me sin by do la- doing laundry? But then again, if I don't do it, then no one in the family will have clothes for the next week. And the answer I gave was something like this. There's nothing wrong with loving and caring for your family. The issue in this commandment, like all of them, isn't whether you do your laundry. The issue is what order you've put your loves in. If doing laundry is overruling your love of God, and how I, how in the world could the love of laundry overrule the love of God, let me ask you, then yes, doing laundry is a sin. Again, there's nothing wrong with doing laundry. We all need to do it, right? But just like Jesus says there's nothing wrong with feeding your animals on the Sabbath, but if laundry keeps us from setting aside quality time and space to be in a loving relationship with our Lord, then there's a problem. Of course, the real solution here in this particular case is to include God in all your laundry. After all, there's a lot of downtime while the machine is running, right? So now I want you to take a look at those lists that you made. Take a look at those top five, top ten lists that you made. Where did you put God? Where does God fall in the order of your loves? And let's be honest here. The people or things we love the most, we make intentional time for. And the more we love them, the more intentional time we give them. Who do you make intentional time for when you wake up? Is God in your early mornings? Who do you make intentional time for as you go to sleep? Is God in your evenings? When you look at your list, where would God honestly fall based on the intentional time you make for God in your life? We are called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength. Do you? However, we also need to know this challenge is not a one-sided thing. In the Bible, the Ten Commandments starts with a preface in which God first makes a promise to us. I am the Lord, your God. Before God asks anything of us, God first makes a commitment to us. I am the Lord, your God. Before before there is an opportunity to succeed or fail, God defines our relationship for all time. I am the Lord, your God. At one place in Scripture, God the Father says we are his children. The fruit of his loins and the babes he nursed at his breasts. 
At another place, Christ says we are his bride, the love of his life and the most important thing in his heart. At another place, the Holy Spirit calls us home, not just any house, but the place where care and attention and love have been invested to make the place truly right. Both Christ and the apostles say that God has made us into temples. The holy place is filled with God's presence. The building in which God delights to make his love known to the world. God has put us at the top of his list. Take a look at your list again. And as you consider God's place in your life, Take a moment to consider our place in God's. God loves us with all of his heart. God made us his first priority. God puts you at the top of his list. Jesus says God has given you so much intentional time that even the hairs on your head are all counted. And for those of you with few hairs on your head, let me bet that God knows so much more than just that one thing. Jeremiah says God knows our hearts and our minds. God knows us through and through. Being at the top of God's list means that God has made intentional time to know you completely, to love you completely, to care for you completely. And so as you consider God's place on your list, I invite you to consider your place on God's list. And then come back next Sunday when we hear the final part of Jesus' speech today and he tells us what it means to have God at the top of our list. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to like if you heard good news and subscribe to stay up to date on the latest message. Peace be with you.